Hello, I'm Dmitry Sitkevetsky, music director of the Greensboro Symphony, and this is Sitkevetsky and Friends Virtual, sponsored by Rice Toyota. Today is a very, very special day because I have my dear, dear friend, a wonderful colleague, my favorite conductor to have next to me in the concert hall. Of course, this is Jerry Schwartz. Jerry, so wonderful to have you. Your uh, titles uh, will probably take most of the program <laughs> because you've done so much, but let me just uh, name three latest ones. Three latest ones in order of uh, sort of the, the latest ones. You're an artistic and music director of the Palm Beach Symphony. You now distinguished professor of the Frost School of Music of Miami University. And that's where we find you now in Miami. And of course, you're the music director and the founder of the All Star Orchestra, which has been doing fantastically. And I will, of course, ask you about all three of them. And uh, before we go to the latest, let me just ask you a personal thing. I don't think we ever discussed it. How come uh, a young boy in a nice Jewish family of Viennese <laughs> extraction, because your both parents were Viennese, and they, I'm sure they brought you up thinking that you'd become either a violinist or a pianist, at the very worst, cellist. But where does trumpet coming <laughs> how did how happened that you you, you became a trumpet player <laughs> well my uh, my you're correct about my parents they really were bringing me up i think to be a doctor like they were but uh they never told me that um i like my sisters thought i studied the piano at the age of five we all did my parents both medical doctors both played the piano my my father actually played quite well when he first came here the United States uh, and was uh, a, a, a intern and resident at St. Mary's Hospital in Hoboken, New Jersey, he would play organ every morning for the nuns at mass. I mean, he was that good. And, uh, and I remember as, as, as I was a young boy, he was taking lessons on, believe it or not, on how to play pop tunes. We had an organ in the basement and he would you know, learn how to play chords and, and I mean, bizarre, you know, but anyway, so we all, I uh, learned piano and, uh, at the age of five. And I was, from the time I was seven, just enamored of the trumpet. I heard the, 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 uh, the great uh, uh, triumphal march from Aida, of Verdi, and that was it. I wanted to play the trumpet. M you know, my parents, they, were very, they, they worked very hard and, and they didn't much care. Uh, but if I wanted to play the trumpet, that was my business. Okay. Uh, I had to start the piano. I had to get great grades in school. I had to play tennis and swim and blah, blah, blah. If I wanted to play baseball, that was my business. But tennis and swimming, that was the family business. If, if I wanted to play trumpet, my business. Piano was the family business. So I, I basically did it on my own. And really, uh, I just loved it. I just loved playing and I loved practicing and I loved the sound. And, uh, and, and, and they were, you know, they were wonderful parents, but, very, very busy. And so they didn't, it's different than parents are these days where we all take so much time with our children. In those days, at least in my family, my parents were working all the time. And except for my mother play, practicing the piano with me, <laughs> you know, we saw each other at dinner. And so my father was always um, willing to allow me to go in whatever direction I wanted. My mother was a little more sarcastic about it. She, she never called it playing the trumpet. She called me a whistleblower. Uh, in these days, you couldn't say things like that. You probably could sue <laughs> your own children. You know? <laughs> it's, it's taking a whole different meaning since then. <laughs> wow. So that's, 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 and then in the end, it was the one f interesting thing that I, I found interesting was that my mother was, uh, you, you probably know people, Jody, my wife is like this too, where they, they intuit things before they happen. So, uh, uh, for example, uh, my mother dreamt as she was pregnant with me that I would be a conductor. Really? Oh, now, really? how bizarre is that? And, and uh, she never even told me that she had thought that. And it wasn't until I was a, uh, uh, I, you know, I was a trumpet player that she said, you know, I had this dream that you were going to be a conductor. Then I definitely didn't want to be a conductor. 
that's going to happen. <laughs> you would have gotten just the opposite. <laughs> I, I, I had no choice. I mean, fate just brought me there, and my mother, my mother was right, uh, and I became a conductor. But actually, the one who became a whistleblower is Jody, because she's, which is a wonderful <laughs> flute, <laughs> <a> Julia. <laughs> that's a lot more of a whistleblower than <laughs> the whole circle. <laughs> <laughs> And when did you feel that you you needed to that that instrument was just too too small for you and the repertoire and the whole thing? When you felt that you need to uh, move on, become a, a, a conductor. It was it was really after I joined the New York Philharmonic. After you joined the New York. Yeah. So when I during my my uh, second year in the Philharmonic, moving into my third year, I uh, you know you started you start you know I was twenty mm, six or seven. And, and you have the option then of having this be your life. Yeah. I mean, there were colleagues I had in the orchestra. One of the main examples, Stanley Drucker, the first clarinet player, who 16. joined the orchestra <laughs> yeah, when he was 16, and then he retired yeah. when he was you know, 75 or whatever it was. I mean, you could make a life there. And most yeah. people did. You didn't join the Philharmonic and then leave. You joined the Philharmonic yeah. and stayed the rest of your life. Uh, and, yeah. uh, you know, at, at my age now, I could be just retiring from the Philharmonic. I mean, really, people stay that long, if you can still play, obviously. Um, so uh, it, it was really, you're right, it was really the repertoire that, that got me to move. It wasn't my dislike from playing. I love orchestras. You, you know I love orchestras. Whether I'm playing when I was playing it or whether I'm conducting them, I mean, I'm an orchestra person. I just love, I love everything about orchestras. And, uh, but the one thing that you don't have as a trumpet player, which you do have as a hyper violinist, <laughs> is the repertoire. I don't have Brahms quartets or Beethoven quartets or Haydn quartets or Mozart quartets or Beethoven, Brahms, you know, Bruch concertos to play. So um, that was really my, my desire to be more immersed in that repertoire. And that's what convinced me to move in a different direction. And I will recall now, our meeting that didn't happen, but you, we were both involved in a, an interesting uh, situation in Moscow and, uh, in 1976. I was in my first long break from performing at, between the age of 21 and almost 23. That was my desire to leave Russia where I stopped performing altogether. And I was trying to convince the, the authorities that I was no longer... Uh, good as a violinist, so they would let me go. And I was that was the June 76, if I'm not wrong, when the New York Philharmonic with Eric Leinsdorf came in and you played a phenomenal Mahler five. That was fantastic. I was there, and but we didn't get to meet. But your uh, roommate was a wonderful cellist, a Jerry Grossman, who I just picked randomly by looking at the orchestra who would be sort of the most innocent <laughs> person because I was approaching him. I approached him twice and I, I came in and I asked him to take uh, a letter, a letter to Solzhenitsyn no less, not from me but from somebody I was trying to help to get published and to get noticed by Solzhenitsyn and all that. And I, I, uh, we made a date that the next day I'll, be I'll approach him just before you board the bus from your Rosia Hotel, which no longer exists. Now, as you know, that, that, that big hotel did now made into a park, but at that time by the Kremlin. And 
uh, in the meantime, he was so, of course, surprised and perplexed by my request that, of course, he talked to you about it. Now it's yours. Well, what was interesting about that, and I remember it very well, and I remember looking at you and thinking about it and, and watching the exchange the next day, obviously. But we were warned uh, before we came on tour, no matter what you do, do not take any letters. Do not take anything from anyone. Uh, a grip is okay as long as it doesn't contain a letter or anything like that. One letter found in a cello or a bass case could jeopardize all of us, jeopardize the tour, and it would be very detrimental to the government. So we were, I mean, this was, we, we were told, just do your job, play, you know, play your concerts, uh, uh, enjoy, uh, but don't interact in, in that kind of way. So when you approached Jerry and said, I think, you know, I'll bring you a record tomorrow of my father and I'll have a record and I'll have a letter stuck inside uh, as, a, as a gift, he then came back to us. So we were the youngsters. So it was me, it was uh, the first horn, John Chimonaro, it was the, the flute player, Rene Siebert, um, and Jerry, me, uh, uh, I don't remember who else was involved, but we all sat around, uh, not sat around, we were outside because we figured everything was bugged. So. And it was. <laughs> and we were walking around and, and talking about this, and yes. we all had opinions about whether you should do it or not. Of course, you know, in life, uh, there are always two choices. The easy way is, no, don't do it. That's the easy way. It's like anything else. It's like shutting down the country if there's, a, if there's this horrible virus. You shut everything down, no problem. Everybody's, everybody's isolated, the economy dies, and you get depressed and so forth. But nobody's dying because you're all uh, quarantined. Or you take a chance. So the question was, was Grossman going to take a chance? Uh, I, I think that the discussion was, uh, was uh, divided. Some thought, yes, why not? I mean, come on, it's a letter. What can it be? And uh, others thought, you know, what, are you kidding? Well, you don't know this fellow. Why bother? Just leave it alone. Don't get yourself and don't, don't take a chance. Right. Uh, he decided, it was his decision, that he was going to take the letter. Now it's your turn. Yeah, and then I, I approached him uh, before the bus going to the concert, to the next program you were doing. And I said, there's a, uh, there a recording, actually, it was Rostropovich and, and Richter, oh. a pretty fun <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, of course, he's a cellist, so I thought that's what he would appreciate. And there is a letter inside. And I said, I, I put also my address. With, if you manage to send it on, uh, just send me a, a little postcard uh, at home, so just saying whatever. That way I will know that it was done, which he did. Which he did, and of course he thought he'd never see me again. Except, <laughs> you know, a, a year and a half later, I was playing already at Juilliard, the Prokofiev first concerto. And Jerry, I called him and he came to the concert and there I was, you know, already at Juilliard having won the competition. But I want to come back to Moscow. It was something you told me much later, but it was happening the same trip that you went to the Red Square after Mile of Five. And this is yours. Well, you know, I have this uh, belief that you only make very important decisions when everything's going really well. For example, you have a job and your boss is horrible to you and then you go home and say, I quit. Mistake. If you have a job and you had the most wonderful success of, of your career and you go home and say, I quit. Okay. Because you're doing it not out of anger, but out of thoughtfulness. So there I was after that Mahler Fifth performance, and I was taking a walk around Red Square by myself. And I said to myself, so I had been in the orchestra already for uh, two years, um, is this what I want to do the rest of my life? Here it is. I felt I really played well. Uh, I, I, Leinsdorf and I were very friendly and very close. And... Um, he was very effusive to me, which is not like him. Not like and, him at all. <laughs> and I, so I'm walking around thinking, is this what I want to do the rest of my life? And that's when I decided, no, I want to do something else uh, in my life. And, and not because I was unhappy. I wasn't. I was very happy. But I just had another level of, uh, of music I wanted to deal with. And so that's when I made my decision. 
uh, you know, Moscow in, in a way has been very important to me because of, of my great friendship with you and your mother and, 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 and some others, of course. And so, and there were so many uh, monumental things that happened in the next years uh, with us when we were together there in 89. I mean, 89, that was a momentous. It's a memories, memories that you, you never leave you. And uh, I, mean, I, mean, I, I mean, I remember you walking to the bus and giving Jerry the, the, the LP. Yeah, I'm sorry, I thought it was your father. <laughs> no, it doesn't matter, because I, <laughs> it was just one, one CD, and I figured he's a cellist, so he must love, at least he knows, and he must Perfect. love Rostropovich, and with Richter especially, it's a rare, rare recording. And, uh, but uh, let's jump now to the, to the, since we're still in Moscow, then in 89, of course, we were uh, not only great friends, but we performed so much with every orchestra, you've ever been in charge, or even just as a guest. We've performed, of course, with New York, New, New York Chamber Symphony. Uh, you invited me to be in Waterloo Festival. I remember that very momentous. Uh, my mother's 60th birthday. You just so happened that on the 16th of July, this was 88, and you were conducting her the mostly Mozart. And of course, you, you invited me in several times there. But she was your soloist. But I was at the same time across the, across the river, across Hudson River. I was in Waterloo in a terrible rainstorm. I remember it was incredible. We had to go. Maxim Shostakovich was conducting the Brook in general. And I finished the Brook. I said, Maxim, sorry. I got around to Russian Samovar. We're having a big party. Right. For my mind. For my mind. Love. You remember Love. that. Yeah, and that was just one of many, many. And then I came back to Russia that year, just six months later, at the end of 88, and I said, I've got to bring my dear friend, fantastic uh, conductor, who will... And then, then two concerts were put together. You conducted a program with Tchaikovsky, Winter Dreams uh, Symphony, the first symphony, and Beethoven Concerto. That was Moscow Philharmonic. And then you brought really challenging wonderful program for them uh half american that was the with the radio with the radio orchestra and you conducted uh, david diamond and david diamond came along he came along for the trip and you came with jody and the maybe one year old gabby was <laughs> I, have to, I have to make a as i made a mistake with the lp i'll tell you the program the program with the radio was the diamond fourth the Barbara Vonnegut that you played. Exactly. Uh, and the Winter Dreams. Yeah. Oh, that was the, the Winter Dreams was the second. With the Moscow Philharmonic was the Beethoven Sixth Symphony. Sixth Symphony, that's right, after oh. the Vonnegut I mean, I'll never forget, the radio especially, because uh, I thought to myself, well, they'll play the Winter Dreams, it'll be fabulous. And then, of course, I have to teach them the Diamond and the Barbara. And before we got there, I think you, you told me that the intendant of the orchestra said they were very nervous about the barber and very nervous about first time the first time both so uh, we started rehearsing both of i mean my memory is they played those two pieces really well i mean i was shocked they sounded what i thought in those days like an american orchestra playing that music and very impressive winter dreams terrible <laughs> 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 they didn't know it at all. First of all, the radio orchestra, they don't do Tchaikovsky so much. Exactly, especially <laughs> first. Yeah. <laughs> in Russia, they don't do one, two, and three. They do four, five, and six, just like everywhere else in the world. So I was so shocked because I thought, oh, they do the barber and the, uh, and, and, and the diamond so well that Tchaikovsky's going to be. And, then, uh, and conversely, of course, the, the, the film. And you worked with them and they played beautifully, beautifully. They played For, concert. Fortunately, there is, there is a... I found on YouTube, there was a, a made a film, The Americans in Russia, and we will watch now the clip which will show exactly what we're talking about.
So, uh, but before that, speaking of momentous occasions, I remember in 78, just about when my mother was to come as an immigrant to New York, I ran into you at Jack Leiser, who was her manager. Uh, and you came out and you say, now it's your story. Uh, uh, um, Jack uh, Leiser was a, a manager, mostly Russian artists. Your mother and Lazar Berman, I think, were the, among the, the real famous ones. Right. And uh, I liked him, and we were friendly. And he said, oh, Jerry, you have to come and hear this pianist. And, uh, and I said, you know, I don't, uh, I, I, I don't hire people from recordings. I, you know, I know, I know what you can do and how you can edit it. He said, no, no, no. I will play you a live recital from Italy. Well, she was at that point. Yeah, exactly. She, she was in Italy. Exactly. And, and so, uh, so I said, okay, fine. So I go to his office and uh, she played Chopin Sonata. And I listened to this and I was just floored. I mean, it was so musical. The sound was so beautiful. In Chopin especially, you do a lot of rubato, but the rubato can sound like affectations, not right. like it's an integral part of the music. And your mother made it all just feel so natural and gorgeous. And I said, oh, I want, I want to work with this incredible artist. He said, well, she's coming to the United States and blah, 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 and you could do her. Uh, you, uh, I said, well, I'm yes, coming with yes, a yes, yes. Yeah. 1980, uh, and we have a Carnegie Hall concert. Maybe I could do her orchestral debut. Uh, and he said, let's try to arrange. It turned out that it wasn't, right, because she played in Brooklyn a little before. Just before, but it was it was really New York, uh, New and York, so, New York concerto. So we we uh, we did the Beethoven first concerto. First, uh, we did that interesting cadenza too. She didn't do the normal long cadenza, which I'd never heard before. Anyway, but that's another story. So yeah, I, I'm leaving. I'm leaving Jacques Leiser, and I and I see you, and I say, oh boy, uh, I've just heard the Spanish, the, the incredible pianist, you know. Yeah, and you know her name because you come from Russia, and, and, and you know, you said, Do you know her name? I said, oh, What's her name? I said, Bella Davidovich. I said, Of course I know her. She's my mother. And we laughed and laughed. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so you went on. <laughs> I said, so a, few days, yeah. a few days later, we meet in the, in the hallway of Juilliard. Julia. And I said, Okay, Dima, stop the fooling around. Now tell me the truth. <laughs> Do you said, know the great pianist, Bella Davidovich? He said, Okay. He said, I'm going to tell you the truth. <laughs> my mother. <laughs> exactly. So it went on for a couple of weeks. You couldn't get a normal answer because you wouldn't believe me. <laughs> Until I finally said, Jerry, read my lips. It's true. I can prove. I can prove. You want to talk to Rostropovich's girls? They will prove. Bela Davidovich is my mother. <laughs> so that's how. That, that is. I, did, I mean, I did so many concerts with your mother, too. Uh, and so much repertoire. And recorded the Greek concerto and the Schumann concerto with him. And the Schumann, Schumann, which he played beautifully. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. I listened to both of them in the last year or so, and I was. I, in fact, I think I contacted you and said, "You know, I just listened to the to the Schumann." Yeah, concerto. exactly to Schumann. I mean, it's 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 the whole life. And speaking of very momentous occasions, also while you were still in uh, New York conducting New York Chamber Symphony and you were already in Seattle. It was probably 89, 90. Somebody who I knew very well uh, just suddenly left Russia, kind of as an emigre, but that was already perestroika time. I think it was after our, after our trip to Moscow. It was, must have been in 89, 90, 90 most likely. 
a wonderful family of two cellists and five-year-old girl. Uh, and that was David Tonkonogi and Mara Finkelstein, who I both knew because he was playing in Bashman's Orchestra, which my uncle was managing, and all of that. There was a lot. And they were absolutely destitute poor in New York. They had no job. Mara, I think, was coming to clean uh, apartments or, you know, just really, they had nothing, no connection. No. And, and the reason they left mostly was because the little girl uh, had leukemia. And they were trying desperately to get to the best place, uh, which was at that time Seattle, because that that, that was the best hospital well, for. Let me interrupt you. They were uh, in New York at Sloan Kettering at Memorial Hospital, which which was a, a, a one of the one of the great cancer hospitals in the United States. So right. they were there, and they were. and I called you, and I said I'm looking for a cellist. To, to have somebody. And you said, yes, I have somebody. And you talked to me about David. I said, fine. So I arranged an audition for him at the 92nd Street Y. So he comes to the 92nd Street Y and he brings somebody else with him, a violinist, a guy named Misha Schmidt. And I said, what, who, what, what's with him? He said, well, I'm coming. I thought I'd bring, I'd bring a, a colleague, a friend, because you may, may need a violinist at some point. Okay, fine. So <laughs> David plays for me and it's... It's fantastic. I mean, it is among the most beautiful playing, so musical, so beautiful. And I said, great. In those days, I was allowed to put people in the finals. So he didn't have to go through preliminaries or semi. I could just put him in the finals. So I said, I want you to come and I want you to play. So uh, he came, and I'll tell the story about him coming, but I didn't know this until later. He came, he played, unanimous, he's in. So great. I mean, Schmidt came too. Uh, and played. He didn't get in, but that's another story. But if he so got into Seattle, eventually he got in. Yeah. So I said, uh, I said to uh, 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 to, to uh, David, "Okay, you're in." He said, "I can't come." So why not? My daughter has leukemia, and she's being treated at Stone Kettering Memorial Hospital, and I can't, I can't leave. I said, "We have the Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center in uh, in Seattle. It is." probably on, on a, almost an equal level with, uh, with Memorial Hospital. Ask your doctor what he thinks. And he asked the doctor, and the doctor said, go, no problem. Uh, I know all the doctors there, we're colleagues, I will set it up for you. And uh, that part of that story was they came, uh, she was cured. Uh, uh, at, at, at Fred Hutch. And David became Julian, my son's cello teacher. I mean, he studied with David. David was his inspiration. It was all of our inspiration. All of yeah, yeah, yeah. He was he one of the kindest, kindest people now, I've ever met. I think you know this story too, but I'm not sure. So this I hear later. He gets to the airport to come to Seattle for the audition with his yeah. cello, goes to the ticket counter, Gives it, and they said, where's the ticket for your cello? He said, uh, what are you talking about? Well, anyway, uh, he didn't have one. And they said, well, there's no problem. There's room. Give me your credit card, and we'll just get the cello on. Of course, David didn't have a credit card, First uh, and he had no money. So he left Mara with the cello and took the bow. You can carry a bow. <laughs> and he came. Then he went to the local <laughs> music store. And he borrowed and he borrowed a cello, which was made probably a month before, a couple of months in before. China, probably. And, yeah. and so he played his audition where he won the job on this cello that he just borrowed from the local string maker. Can you imagine? I mean, what what a story! What and a David, great. you know, David was was one. I mean, one of the great human beings of the world. Absolutely.
and the great Tanger Center, 3,000, you know, fantastic hall, which hasn't ha hasn't been opened yet, but will be there hopefully. And you will conduct Weber uh, Freischutz Overture, yes, one of your favorites, and then Mendelssohn. That's sort of the the Milstein used to say that that's the only vi a, a, a concerto that's written for violin and also not against the violin because he, he believed Beethoven and Brahms and everything that they didn't know how to, to write for the violin. So that's really the only for the violin. It's, it's pretty much a perfect violin concerto. Have to admit. It is, and of course, the, one of our friends, one of your friends, uh, Sam LeBauer, who played the violin, played that piece. Uh, and yes. he uh, it's his favorite piece in the world. I think he sent me an I email. I think he listens to it every day. I think he listens to it every day. <laughs> he wished he could play it every day. He would. <laughs> but he's been, he, he, he's been a fantastic doctor. And of course, and, and I still go to the Lebauer Clinic. My doctor is, is the one he recommended, who was also his doctor, Alex wow. Vietnikov. So it's all, it's all human connection. So, I mean, it's, it's really quite, quite remarkable how we've always... And now, look, we're talking about at a very momentous time. I wanted to ask you how you deal with this whole, you know, completely crazy, completely unusual. Now we sort of used to it a little bit, uh, but situation where we cannot perform, situation where we can't really travel. In Europe, it's a little bit better, uh, but still. And what you've been doing this 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 last five months, if you don't mind, just you know, telling me. It, our whole concept of time has changed. Every day, the concept of time has changed because I'm, I'm as most, if, if you know me, I'm a workaholic. I'm always nursing. Yeah, so. I love it. I'm always involved. And all of a sudden, uh, the thing I do the most and love the most conducting uh, great music doesn't exist. It's not part of my life anymore. So I can't, I can't do what I do. Uh, so what, what should I do? Well, if I got the virus early on in March. And so I was quarantined, uh, quarantined myself, and Jody quarantined. And so we spent the pretty, we were in New York. Our daughter Gabriella had gotten married on the 6th of March, I think was the date. And then after, shortly after that, we both quarantined ourselves. And so the whole month of March was just gone. It was gone because we were exhausted and the temperature and all of that. So that, that's on. Then we get into April. And, and so you have all this time on your hands. And uh, a certain amount, if I can say, a certain amount of depression, because you can't, you can't operate. So, you, you know, what I started doing was literally forcing myself, forcing myself to do things. So I wrote one book. I'm, uh, you know, halfway through a second book. Wow. I, uh, I've written a couple of pieces. Uh, that one is a, 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 a version of, a, of an earlier piece and one is a new piece. So I forced myself to, uh, to compose. Um, I've done some additions like you do, as we all do all the time. Yeah. And, I, and I, keep, I keep doing that. I um, got involved with this project of the, of the Schubert Great Symphony and editing it and really focusing on it. Uh, I'm doing a lot of reading, a lot of reading of books, music books and novels and uh, all kinds of, of things that I rarely have time to read. Um, then I, I'm also, I also now, you know, I'm teaching. So I teach at, at the University of Miami, the Frost School. And uh, there's been a lot of time spent about that. How do we begin? Can we begin? And, and that's been really interesting. So what happened? So April, we I started, you know, working in New York. Uh, May, we come out here to Miami and meetings every day because we're trying to open the school. We're trying to give the students an opportunity to do what they want to do, which is to grow. And we want to teach, whether you're at a university or whether you're teaching, conducting a violin, we're teachers. We're all teachers. And you, you feel so, so committed to the students. You want to give to them. But how can you do that in this environment? So here at the University of Miami, they've been incredible. They've invested millions of dollars, 
built new facilities, built tents that have great air circulation, uh, redone all the classrooms so that the social distance, redone most of the vent systems and put some of these ultraviolet lights in the system to kill bacteria, uh, had making sure the air circulates. I mean, it's just crazy what they've done. And we're still not sure it's going to work. But in, by doing that, I've changed my opening program uh, four times now. <laughs> So I had my opening program, which included Brahms Fourth and, and some new music. Well, that was gone. Then I was going to do a string and percussion piece because the winds were the problem. So we can play with masks. And, and so on Bartok music with strings, percussion, celeste, and, and Tchaikovsky strings. I mean, well, that didn't work because the, 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 so, some of the students decided not to come. I didn't have a large enough string body, so then I got rid of that. Then my, the, the version I have now is a piece that you, I, I know, love, the Chedrin uh, Carmen uh, Suite. Yeah, I got it. Strings and percussion, wow. and uh, a piece of George Walker and uh, and the uh, Metamorphosis of Strauss, oh. which fits the instrumentation. So that's this version. Now, maybe that'll change. Uh, the other thing that's happened is that we've started a, an orchestral uh, conducting program here, which we hadn't had before. Uh, of any significance, so we created a conducting orchestra. Well, that's a whole nother thing, <laughs> and pick the students, which is a whole nother. I mean, it's been crazy. Then I've taught, uh, through Eastern, I had 14 conducting students. Uh, and I taught them eight hours a week for five weeks uh, on Zoom. And it was fun and interesting. And students who I would not have really probably uh, been exposed to before, they were all great from different schools, from, mm -hmm. from uh, Berkeley and, and from Manhattan School of Music and from out of all different places. Uh, Ball State and uh, I think Ohio State, I mean, whatever. And it was really interesting because what we dealt with, we dealt with studying scores. They couldn't conduct an orchestra, so they conducted records, which is bad because they can't do interpretive things, they can't do tempos, they can't do balance, they can't do correction. All they can do is beat. So you can actually make comments about their beats. So you, so you studied the, I mean, in fact, they did the, 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 in front of the, uh, the, uh, the, the final dance from, uh, um, by the spring, you know, all these changing meters and they were, they were, I mean, they were fantastic. And so I spent, it was a lot of effort, uh, even though you think it'd be easy, you have to actually prepare and think of what, what you, what you're doing. And, and, and what I did in that class that I really enjoyed because the kids were so smart was I said, what's on your mind today? Right? Most people, these students were just, whew, it was incredible. And, uh, you know, you and I are the same. You ask a question, and 20 minutes later, exactly. <laughs> the next anyway, so. Uh, wonderful. That's so wonderful. I did that. And now, then, and then, we were, uh, then we were back in New York for a while, and now we're here again, and we have finished our first week of classes. Oh, really? uh, it's a little odd. Uh, when every, you know, you conduct a little, I have a conduct, the conduct, the actual orchestra doesn't start till September 9th, but the conducting orchestra is playing now and mm -hmm. everybody is so spread out. It's spread out. It's incredible. And it makes it for the conducting students, it's actually good because they're, a fo they're forced to be clear because yeah. you can't rely only on your ear. And so that's really, uh, that's really been interesting. period when we were growing up, of course, I'm, I'm older than you, but still. Not a little bit, too much. Uh, now it's very. You know, there was, I think about composers, because I was lucky in terms of American composers, having known, you know, whether it's Sam Barber or Aaron Copeland or, right. or, or, or uh, you know, William Schumann or David Diamond, we knew them all. 
and we knew them we knew them in a personal personally yeah and uh, and and again you know, the great conductors of course and how lucky we are in a way um uh you're right we're you know we've done a lot we've done and we will continue to do a lot but our children uh, their careers are just emerging uh, my 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 son julian julia, 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 julia. julia i mean it's just it, it, and to have that just stop like that just when things are just taking off it's very tricky and very difficult and uh and so you know they um yeah, to keep motivated and to keep uh, positive and to keep thinking in in a positive way is not so simple maybe a little easier for us because we have we have the advantage of the wisdom of age but uh, but for the younger people it's very hard now, I'm, I'm not talking about our kids so much now is all those others you know, when I go to when I go to the Frost School, these these students are so I, I not to use the word desperate, but so anxious to get back to playing. I, I gave a little oboe lesson the other day, and the oboe player said, "Do you realize when I played my audition, it was the first time I played on the stage in five months?" And I mean, you think, "Oh, uh, but for a kid, boy, it's a, it's a lifetime. It's 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 enormous." Uh, and to, to have us all come together with, for the conducting orchestra, we're doing some handle control grossos right now, and to have us all playing together, I mean, the people are just so excited to actually make music together. Okay. And really we have to, we, life goes on. Yeah, yeah. People will get sick. Horrible things will happen, but life goes on. Life goes on, and the music will be there because this is something we're so lucky. We 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 have we've spent our lifetime with, as, as you know, somebody observed on the. On the, on the plane, probably. He said, oh, what are you doing? I said, well, oh, it must be a lonely life. You're always on the road. He said, yeah, but I have wonderful companions. Yeah. I always travel with Bach, with Mozart, with Beethoven, with Shostakovich, with Prokofiev. With, you know, these are wonderful companions. You know, we've been very lucky to, to lucky spend our, our life with those, you know, phenomenal geniuses. And they're just as close to us as real people. For me, the you know that that's a, the violin, yeah, and the violin, yeah, yeah. I remember how you you were practicing your trumpet just to keep to keep the chops in in place while watching baseball game. Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't that? I remember. I, that. I, so I just got, <laughs> <laughs> not to give anybody any ideas, but that. <laughs> That's, I mean, I used, to, I used to read Count of Monte Cristo, you know, while practicing as, as a little boy. And then when I would turn the page, because the book is quite thick, boom, everything would fall down. <laughs> but, you know, you do what you, these days it's a lot easier. I just put iPad with the times or paper <laughs> to do my scales. <laughs> but you still got to do your scales anyway. Jerry, it's been such a pleasure to, to, to have you here. It's just like, you know, we never really parted. We have a friendship of uh, 43 years. Wow. It's quite wow. extraordinary. Just around this time, when I came to New York in uh, September 11, 1977, and we met two weeks after that. You were one of the first uh, conductors to have come in, even, even to uh, to do the Heldenleben. And I had just learned, I never even heard the piece because it was not played in Russia, but I learned it just to, to for the audition, which was the next day after I got into National Orchestra Association. They gave me 10 solos, only one I knew, Shekhar is out. So that was one of them. And you looked at me and said, who's that? And Ever since we, we really never, never parted since then. <laughs> so anyway, let's stay healthy and meet on stage and, and many times before. Yeah. And many times. Bye bye. bye, -bye.